What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Somebody waiting for anything? You all got everything you want, right? Everything right now. What's anybody waiting for? Somebody's got to be waiting for something. How many of you are waiting for lunch? Anybody forget breakfast this morning? Stomach ground a little bit? Oh, come on, you can tell me. How many of you are waiting for the sermon to be over so you can get out of here? I am. No, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. Just kidding. No, I'm here all day today. Kara's going to let my dog out for me. I am here all day. What are you waiting for, Lisa? Christmas. Christmas. Anybody else waiting for Christmas? What else is anybody waiting for? Hmm? Peace in your heart. Amen. I'm waiting for a little peace in my heart. I'm waiting for the 13th of December when I have a neurology appointment. Try to figure out where my voice went and everything else. So we're all waiting for something, aren't we? I don't know if you noticed that wait is the one word that appeared in all three of the lessons this morning. The Hebrew Bible lesson from Isaiah. There were really three people who wrote under Isaiah's name, which is not trying to fake anybody out. It's just the way it was in those days. The first part of Isaiah says, you better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. I'm telling you why. God's watching and you're being unfaithful. It's a little bit of a paraphrase there, but that's sort of the gist of it. Then at 40, 40 that you hear read at funerals often, comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord your God. I'm going to read that one next Sunday. But that is the second part of Isaiah when they come back to the land after the exile. Then they get back to the land and it's destroyed and they're all sad and broken hearted and they look around and they start acting up again and whining because, you know, God's people know how to whine, right? Amen? Come on, you're God's people. You know how to whine, don't you? Well, this part of Isaiah is, is sort of a penitential saying, whoops, we've messed up, Lord. And it says, oh, that you would tear from the heavens and come down, tearing the same as the robe, the tearing of robes, which is a sign of remorse and great anguish. You know what it sounds like when you rip fabric, don't you, that awful sound of ripping? This is going back to the beginning of Isaiah. Remember the call of Isaiah? He's called, he says, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. God says, I can fix that. And the angel comes with a burning tongs, tongs with a burning coal and touches his mouth and says, okay, now you can speak for me. So I've cleansed you. And talks about God's hem filling up the whole of the temple. This is a sort of, sort of a similar image here because this is God who is greater than anything you can imagine, bigger than anything you can picture. God's robes are the heavens and God is, they want God to tear open the heavens and come down. Tear your robe open in remorse and come down. Why remorse, though? Interesting, isn't it? Because this is supposed to be a penitential sort of song to God here. Penitential meaning, whoops, we've messed up, Lord, and we're sorry. But what if it turns and says very quickly, uh-oh, it's your fault, Lord, because you were angry, we sinned, you hid yourself, we transgressed. If you'd been here, Lord, we would have been on the straight and narrow, Lord. We would have been doing things right, Lord. Nope, I don't think that's true, but that's what... Isaiah speaks on behalf of the people to God. Usually a prophet is speaking from God to the people. This time it's, he's given the people's answer here. We've all become like one who's unclean and our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. That's in reference to women at their time of the month, really. But that's the sort of uncleanliness that can be cleaned up very quickly by ritual purification, which means it's not an ongoing thing. And it says, we're like leaves in the wind. I thought that this week as I walked out my bedroom window and saw leaves blow in every direction as I read this passage again and again. We're lifeless. We've lost our vitality because we're not connected to God anymore. But then it says, but you, O Lord, are our father. We are clay and you are a potter. We are the work of your hand. The putty in your hands, Lord, you can remake us, reshape us, remold us. I shared with you once before about preaching from Jeremiah, when Jeremiah said, go down to the potter's house and watch him work with the clay. I had a potter in one of my congregations, and I said to him, would you please come and throw a pot during worship? He said, what? I said, bring your wheel and set it up in the chancel. He said, you know that makes a lot of mess, don't you? I said, we'll put plastic down. We put a lot of plastic down. Because Jeremiah didn't say, picture in your mind the potter's house. He said, go and watch the potter. And I said, Charlie, what you need to do is, and this was a man who was a retired art school professor, college level. 
who quit and had his own ceramic business, but he didn't use the wheel. He just made beautiful ceramic pieces without the wheel. I said, what you have to do the first time, you have to make it and make it wreck, and then the second time you have to make it perfectly. And he said, no pressure there. He said, I haven't thrown a pot in years. I don't know if I can do that right. So he makes this beautiful pot as we sit and watch. Everybody's fascinated, staring at him. He says the most beautiful thing he'd ever made, and he had to wreck it, so he stuck his finger in it and it collapsed on itself. The second one he made was just as perfect. So it was God saying we can be reshaped and reformed. And Charlie told me something about clay that has always stuck with me. Until it is subjected to the fires of the kiln, it can be reshaped just by adding water. It doesn't matter if it's sat there 50 years. If it hasn't been fired, it can be reshaped because all you have to do is put water in and it'll be soft, pliable again. God gives us the waters of baptism. God gives us water of life, and God can reshape and remold us. So even though Isaiah is saying, we messed up, Lord, but it's your fault, he's also saying, but we are clay in your hands. You can reshape us into what you'd like us to be. Blessed are those who wait for this. Now that's waiting when Messiah had not come yet. That's before Jesus, and they're waiting. So let's skip the gospel for a moment and look at what happens then in our epistle lesson this morning, which is the time after Jesus was raised. The first letter to the church in Corinth, one of Paul's great writings, Paul is telling them to wait for Christ to be revealed again. But what does he say? In the meantime, we've been given gifts. We have the gifts of the Spirit. We have the power of the Spirit at work in us. We don't need Christ's presence in the world to have Christ in the world. We just have to live up to our, our image that is implanted in each of us. We are all imprinted with the image of God, aren't we? And of Jesus Christ and gifted by his spirit to do things until he comes again. I want to get to the lesson that is not from today's lectionary. This is from Luke instead of Mark, because I'm not a Mark fan. I'll tell you that right now. I like Mark. Smiley, but not Mark. It's gospel. So I'm grinning back there. But we're called to wait again. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good and pleasure to give you the kingdom. The kingdom. That is a powerful promise, isn't it? It is God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom, meaning to give us the time of Christ's reign, to give us the time of peace and prosperity, of shalom, of wholeness. All that is ours, given to us. We're called to have our treasures there and not here on earth. Because this is where the thief comes near and steals, and not in heaven. Nothing can take heaven from us. Nothing can take the kingdom from us. Nothing can take Christ from us. So we're called to know. We don't know when the thief is coming, or we wouldn't let the house be broken into. How many of you, if you knew you were going to be robbed, would leave your doors open and your windows open and have a sign saying, whoops, we're out for the day? Last week, my neighbor called me and says, Terry, are you home? I said, nope. She said, you know your garage door is open. I said, no, I did not know that. I drove off with my garage door open. I thought, there's going to be nothing in my house when I get back. But there was. No one got there. I said, if you see anybody, call the police. She laughed. said, I already thought about that. But if you thought a thief was coming, would you leave everything unlocked and open? Would you get out the silver and open the safe and say, take what you will? No, you would have had everything locked up. We're called to be on watch. This time Christ again is the bridegroom, but we're called to be there to open the door for him when he comes. We're called to wait, 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 wait. So what are we waiting for? Isaiah and his crowd, they were waiting for Christ to come and kick the behind of all their enemies. That's what they thought was going to happen. It's the Messiah they wanted. They wanted a mighty warrior king to come with his army and clear out everybody who had done wrong to the people of Israel, get rid of them. There are people in Israel today who think that's what God's going to do when the Messiah comes for them. He's going to clean up the mess that they've made and the mess that the people who don't like them have made. But that's not what Christ is about, is it? We're called to wait, not as optimism, not just saying things can only get better from here. We're called to wait and to hope. And hope does mean waiting. One of the Hebrew roots that I cannot for the life of me think of right now. Oh my golly, it's gone from my brain. I did not write it down. I should have written it down. I'll tell you next week what it is. One of those Hebrew words that we translate as, as hope means literally waiting. When Noah was on the boat with the animals, he had to wait, 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 wait. When they were wandering in the desert, they had to wait. So sometimes hoping means waiting, doesn't it? 
not just thinking everything's going to be okay tomorrow. It's not a Pollyanna sort of thing, like everything's going to be all right one day. But it's waiting and hoping together. Now, if you look at the slide up here, this is the picture that I talked about, the painting that I talked about in my last newsletter article. That is called Hope. It was painted in the 19th century by a painter named Watts. And does it look hopeful to you? Can you see what she's doing? She's blindfolded, she's sitting on a globe, and she's listening very closely to the lyre that has one string left on it, one string. I thought, wow, that's not very hopeful, is it? But it is, isn't it, if you think about it? She's still playing, she's still listening to the music, however faint it is, that God is gonna come and redeem the world. That has to be our hope. It has to be our, what we're waiting for. We have to wait for Christ to come. But until then, we're not called to just sit and twiddle our thumbs while we wait, are we? We're called to be the presence of Christ in the world because we have been given power from on high, power by the Spirit to do everything that Christ has done and more. Jesus said, you, know, you think the things I've done are amazing. Well, you see what you can do because you can do this and more because I'm going to send you my Spirit. That's what he says, and that's what he did. At Pentecost, he poured out the Spirit, and we just sort of duck and cover, don't we? Like, I don't want any of those gifts. It means I've got to work in the church. But it's not inside of this building. It's not about coming to dinner Tuesday, although I hope you come to dinner. I hope you order dessert, because we'll get 10% of what you eat. It's not about coming to the live nativity, but I hope you'll do it, because I need some help. I can't play all those parts out there by myself and build the set by myself and everything else. But it's about being the church in the world. It's about going into the world, proclaiming righteousness and justice, peace. Peace that transcends not just the brokenness between peoples, but peace that flows from your heart into the world that says to people, we do not have to live this way. We do not have to be enemies with one another. We do not have to mistrust people because of the color of their skin or their background or their accent because every one of us bears God's image and we're called to bear it into the world where Christ is already. He's going to come again, but until he comes, we're called to wait for him. Wait as people expecting things to change. Wait as people hoping for a new reality. As people who are certain that Christ is coming. It's not just an if or a maybe. It is a when Christ comes again in glory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. That's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to feast at the banquet that leads us to the heavenly banquet. But until Christ comes, you are called to be his presence in the world. I see it in all each of you. I think I know everybody here now. I see it in each of you every time you open your mouth and proclaim Christ with your kindness, with your hard work, with your dedication, with your love, with your forgiveness, with your grace and your peace. That is how Christ is made known. We just can't share him with each other here. We've got to take him into the world. Or the world will not know him. So think about the hope up here. She doesn't look very hopeful. There are days I feel like this. I'm telling you right now, I feel like I'm sitting there plucking on a one-string lyre. But I know that Christ will come again. And he's going to redeem everything on heaven and on earth. He's going to bring them together and we're going to have peace because that is what he promised and that is who he is. The glory of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, and amen.